غریب است و قبهش مفهوم A stranger, he is called, buried in a remote land, yet men and women stand in amazement of his humility, knowledge and wisdom. Who was this personality? Why is he so special? And why do millions of people visit his burial site every year? Imam Rida is the eighth Imam of the Shias and he's descendant of the Prophet وسلم, and his forefather Imam Ali and Lady Fatima He was born in the city of Medina in the year 148 years after Hijrah and his mother was uh, Hazrat Najma he had uh, many titles uh, alongside the uh, one that was given to him, such as al rida For example, he was known as Al-Wafi, which means the loyal one, or Al-Sabir, the patient one. And uh, he is uh, considered to be um, the most knowledgeable uh, man of his time. Many people came to him and referred to him when it comes to matters of faith and uh, seeking guidance on uh, aspects of their lives. The Imams are appointed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is the belief of all the 12 Shias. However, a recognition has to be made and people have to be made aware who the next Imam is. And it's always been the case that the Imam of the time would inform his closest followers as to who the next Imam would be, so that after their death, there is no succession. Imam Musa ibn Ja'far al-Kadhim would gather his companions on many occasions in the presence of his son Imam Ali ibn Musa Rida, and he would uh, inform them and stress that the successor and the wasi after him and the Imam and the representative of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, after him would be this son of his. So for example we have Zayd ibn Marwan al-Qandi who says uh, in, in a narrated hadith found in Kitab al-Arshad by uh, Shaykh al-Mufid that uh, once I was in the presence of Imam Musa al-Kadhim alayhi salam who uh, showed me his son and said this is my son, his writings are my writing, his teachings are my teachings, his words are my words, his messengers are my messengers, therefore you should follow him and obey him after me. <laughs> He referred to the story of Prophet Ibrahim السلام, and Allah SWT tells us that the Prophet Ibrahim went through many tests and trials and when he passed them all successfully Allah SWT granted him, appointed him, selected him as an Imam for the community. قال إني جاعلك للناس إماما. So إمامة 
means the divine leadership, which means that not selection in the sense that people will vote for him or election is there, it is the appointment from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. <laughs> Imam Ali ibn Musa Ridha alayhi salam was uh, born on the 11th of the holy month of Dhul Qa'dah and that was a few weeks after the martyrdom of his grandfather Imam Ja'far al-Sadiq alayhi salam who according to narrations um, said that he desired to meet the Imam but uh, unfortunately was martyred uh, on the 25th of Shawwal 148 after Hijra and therefore was not able to meet Imam al-Radha. Uh, narrations from Imam al-Sadiq uh, mention how he stressed and uh, emphasized the position of Imam al-Radha, that he was the illuminating light of the Ahl al-Bayt and that the knowledge will ooze from him. Imam Musa al-Kadhim was in Medina, but later on was summoned to Baghdad by Harun al-Rashid. So later on, we know that during the imprisonment of Imam Musa bin Jafar, Musa al-Kadim in Baghdad, Imam Ridha was in Medina. So he was born in such a family. His father, Imam Musa al-Kadim the seventh Imam, his mother was Najm Khatun, the uh, respected lady who brought him uh, according to the Islamic standards. So a pure and purified father, very respected mother, and from this father and this mother, Imam Ali ibn Sarida, was in a best position to lead the Muslim Ummah after the seventh Imam. <laughs> his eyes. The first person, the first face that Imam Rada saw was that of his father, the holy Imam. And it was customary, and it is a sunnah. The seventh Imam recited the Adhan and the Iqama, and he gave him, as according to certain traditions, sweet water or honey. He made him taste it. There was joy in the house, there was celebration in the house, uh, because a beautiful baby has been born. And his mother was of uh, Moroccan origin. She was a slave girl and who was known for her piety and for her modesty and chastity. And uh, Imam Musa ibn Ja'far al had selected her and uh, she had seen um, this type of uh, uh, relationship or this uh, selection in her dream and understood that she had an important uh, role to play. The childhood of the Imams is somehow like the other childhood from other people, but the distinction is there that the Imams have been and always been trained to be the role models, the exemplars, the teachers, the guides for the humanity. This means that all the Islamic values, all the ethical enhancements and whatever leads to purification of the soul, Every single step was meant to serve that purpose, to go towards that goal. Imam Radha childhood was spent um, in the city, holy city of Medina, the city of Rasulullah, whereby he was uh, nurtured and uh, brought up by his holy father, Imam Musa ibn Ja'far al-Kadhim and uh, he was, uh, of course, deprived of uh, being in uh, close proximity to his father because his father uh, was very much uh, persecuted by the Abbasid uh, Khalifs at that time. Uh, many of them were fearful of the influence of the Ahl al-Bayt, of the Imams of the Ahl al-Bayt, and therefore they kept a close eye on the uh, Imam himself and uh, later on uh, took the Holy Seventh Imam to uh, Baghdad and he was taken from one prison to another. 
whilst Imam Ridha السلام, would spend that time in Medina and narrations say that uh, he would uh, hold sessions of uh, um, teaching and dissemination of the knowledge of the Ahlul Bayt السلام, in the mosque of the Holy Prophet and many people would benefit from uh, his presence and from his knowledge. Somebody was talking, he would never interrupt him out of respect for that person. Whatever he was saying, he would never interrupt him. The other traditions that we have is that once a person came from pilgrimage and for some reason he had lost his money and he had to go back to his hometown. So he approached Imam Rada and asked him for some money. There were a lot of people around him. Imam waited for everybody to leave. Then the Imam went to his quarters. He called him and without showing him face, he gave him some money so that he could take that with him in order to get back to his home. One of his companions who was there with the Imam, he said, Imam, why did you not show your face? And he says, I did not want him to feel that I am a beggar and I am getting something from somebody else. So that was the humility that Imam was trying to show to his people. This is how you give your charity so that the other person doesn't feel humiliated. It is obvious that whilst learning from his father, Imam Musa al-Qadim whilst attending whatever needed from the teachings of his, uh, the Imams before him, yeah, there is something extra and we call this Al-Ilmu al -ladunni. That knowledge which is given direct by Allah. Sometimes people think that we are doing exaggeration and trying to refer to our Imams what they don't have. No. Allah SWT clearly says in the Quran, So piety and righteousness, according to these two ayat in the Quran, lead to the opening of the eyes of the person and the knowledge they give, it is not like the normal knowledge that one can to attend a classroom, for example, or learn from a teacher or read in a book. No, no. It is for every righteous believer, according to the ayah in the Quran, that when they exercise the taqwa, the piety, righteousness, they get the inspiration from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the ilham. The, the knowledge which is not dependent to reading the book or learning from a teacher. Even this, which is combined with the normal way of being trained in a family like the Imamat family, of course, this childhood we understand to be always to prepare this young boy who would become later on the Imam of the community as having, first of all, being purified according to Ayat al-Tathir and at the same time being prepared for being a role model, to be Imam, to teach. And one more we know that our Aqeedah, according to uh, principles of religion and faith in Islam and Shiism, that the Imam must be superior to every single member to all members of the, the community so which means that their knowledge their attitude their behavior their akhlaq everything in them their manner everything must be superior to others which means that they are the best and this wouldn't happen by itself it needs a struggle strive even the prophet sallallahu we see that although he is appointed by the Prophet, by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but his struggle, his continuous efforts to be vigilant all the time, to work for that goal, all these will lead in something different, distinct from other people. And that is what we see in the life and the early days of Imam al the way he acted, again with humility and treating them as equal,
He would never sit on a dinner table until and unless the whole family had sat, which included his servants and his slaves. According to one tradition, uh, it has been reported by one of his companions, Abu Sal, that uh, once this thing happened, where Imam had called all his slaves and they sat on the, on, 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 on the dinner table, in those days it was not the tables that we, we sit on, but it was on the floor. One of his companions says, why don't you separate the two? The slaves can eat separately, as we can eat separately. And Imam was not happy with that statement. And he told his companion, he said that we are all, Allah is one, we are all from the same mother. Everybody is equal. The only way to differentiate people is not by their creed, by color, but it is by their taqwa, by their nearness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Going to the public bath. And whilst the Imam Ali Salam was busy with cleaning his himself and his body, somebody who did not know the Imam, yeah, sit next to him, sat next to him, and the skin of the Imam was known to be a little dark. So that gentleman who sat next to the Imam Ali Salam, he said that, oh man, would you please pour some water on my head and help me with watching myself. The Imam Ali Salam did not say no. He helped him and the other people were surprised and then tried to blame him. Do you know who is that? He's Imam Ridha. He is the eighth Imam of the Shia. He is the descendant of the Prophet How dare you to uh, look down on him and think that, oh, he's like a servant to, to help you with pouring water on you. So he apologized, but the Imam Ali said, no, no problem. I mean, it is just a request from any fellow Muslim or fellow believer, yeah? And I was happy to do so. On the table as we look uh, for the dinner or lunch, without inviting the servants, those who normally would be considered as the lower class in the society to sit with them, to eat with them and not to start eating before they eat. So again this shows the uh, spirit of Imam salam is so high and so great that he treats even the servants, even the uh, people who normally are counted as the lower class of the society, treat him in a very, very reasonable and great way. In addition to the names, have the title. For example, Imam Musa al kadhim his father, was called al kadhim al kadhim is the one who can control his anger and it refers to incidents and one very well reported and documented that he always was able to control his anger not allowing his ego to uh, disrupt or to do something uh, wrong this is about al kadhim al rida when Somebody submits everything to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, is content and pleased with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, is pleased with. Okay? If you refer to the, uh, the ayah of the Quran, radiyallahu anhum wa radu an. So these believers are those, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is pleased with them, and they are pleased with what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ordained for them. Yeah? So a rida is a symbol and a manner or the title for a personality like Ali ibn Musa, the eighth Imam, that he submitted to the will of Allah SWT, pleased with what Allah SWT ordained for him, and not even having inside 
some sort of complaint or uh, being not happy about it. Reza was a name, was a title given to the eighth Imam by his father, according to many traditions. Because he said that Allah and the angels are pleased with him in the world, in the, in the, in the upper worlds, that is in the universe, whereas the people and the Prophet and the Imams are pleased with him in this earth. The reason why he was given this title was that the enemies as well as friends were pleased with him. In other words, they were mesmerized by his uh, personality. And even though they may have disliked him, uh, they somehow were happy with him in one sense. This is rejected by some people uh, who present the idea that even when he became the heir apparent to uh, Ma'moon al-Abbasi, he was disliked by many people because they feared that the caliphate would be in the hands of the uh, descendants of Amir al-Mu'mineen Ali ibn Abi Talib alayhi salam. So for example, we have a story that when he was in uh, modern day Mashhad in Khurasan in Merb, he would uh, be going towards uh, the palace of Ma'moon and there would be heavy curtains before the entrance which need to be um, opened by a few people. And some who disliked him said, we would not do this. We would not uh, open the curtains for him. And they stood aside. As soon as he came close, a huge wind uh, blew and it opened up the curtains for him and he entered and likewise when he left the same thing happened. This demonstrated that many people there as well as in Baghdad who were also against the caliphate of Al-Ma'mun, uh, the supporters of his uh, brother Al-Amin who was killed by Al-Ma'mun, uh, despised the Imam. فَلَا وَرَبِّكَ لَا يُؤْمِنُونَ حَتَّى يُحَكِّمُوكَ فِي مَا شَجَرَ بَيْنَهُمْ ثُمَّ لَا يَجِدُوا فِي أَنفُسِهِمْ حَرَجًا مِمَّا قَضَيْتِ وَيُسَلِّمُوا تَسْلِيمًا In this ayah Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us about the criteria of Iman, faith. That faith and Iman and the complete Iman will not happen if we do not surrender we do not submit to the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Yusallimu taslima. So Imam Rida salam was named and called as Rida because of that. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is pleased with the individual and the human being is pleased with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The word Rida and its derivatives are mentioned many times in the Quran and it highlights this uh, complete contentment and satisfaction of the human being with their creator, the Almighty subhanahu wa ta'ala. In other words, they're submissive. Whatever is presented before them, they are patient and are steadfast and they do not complain to anyone, neither do they express their unhappiness about what is happening to them to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Rather, they are thankful at all times. And one thing what we need to understand is these titles that were given to the Imams, they are not restricted to one Imam and this is not something that can be applied to one and not the others. So for example, Imam Sadiq is also from those who are considered to be of the uh, Radin or uh, he was also known as a Rida. Likewise, Imam Al-Kadhim Al was also a Sadiq. But these titles were used by the people at that time to describe a character that was distinguished and that stood out from the personality of the Imam concerned. Therefore, all the Ahlul Bayt enjoy these special characteristics that got them so close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But sometimes they were known by certain titles that people knew them. <laughs> Shabbat
What is called now Mashhad, that time wasn't Mashhad because only named Mashhad after the martyrdom of Imam Rida alayhi salam. It was Tus or the whole province was called Khurasan. Uh, when Imam Rida alayhi salam was summoned to there, uh, he was accompanied by people to come through many, many cities, ending up with Nishabur. And Nishabur is approximately nowadays two hours drive uh, from Mashhad or to Mashhad, yeah? uh, where uh, the, the history tells us that thousands of scholars and narrators of hadith went to welcome Imam Rida salam and listen to a hadith from him. And that hadith was so important that it is called by all scholars as the golden chain, Silsilat al Dhahab. He stood to say to them that I narrate from my father, from his 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 father Amir al Mu'mineen, from the Holy Prophet of Islam, from Jibra'il, from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that Kalimatu la ilaha illallah husni, faman dakhala husni amina min adabi. The word la ilaha illallah is my fortress. Whomsoever enters this fortress will be saved from my punishment. And when he said this, people became joyful that this utterance of the word la ilaha illallah somehow is the cause for them to be safe from the punishment of hell. But the Imam then continued with an important addition, one that must not be forgotten and it needs to be emphasized from time to time. He then said, Bisharthiha wa shurutiha wa ana min shurutiha. This word la ilaha illallah comes with its own terms and conditions. And one of the most important conditions is the Imam of the Ahl al Bayt, as mentioned by Imam al Rida, salawatullahi wa salamuhu alayhi. There is a science called the Ilmu Rijal where before you confirm the authenticity of the hadith, you look at the chain of narrations. And then you would study the lives of each of the narrator to find out whether that what was the lifestyle of that person, whether he was an authentic person or whether he was there during the time that the hadith was transmitted to him. And all this, this is a, this is a science that is um, the, 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 this, is a, this is a science of understanding whether the hadith is authentic or not. In this case, the Imam, when he started the hadith, he said that it is, I have uh, heard it from my father. Who heard it from his father? And from his father. And Hon for his brother. So he was going from all the Imams. So it was from his father, Musa Kazim, from, who heard it from Imam Ja'far Sadiq, who heard it from Imam Muhammad Bakir, who heard it from Imam Zainul Abidin, who heard from Imam Hussein, who heard it from his father Imam Ali, who heard it from the Holy Prophet, and the Holy Prophet said that Jibra'il came with this hadith to me, which was from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And if you look at this chain, you don't need to work on Ilm Rijal because these were infallible. These were people who never ever lied in their lives. And therefore the authenticity of the hadith has been stamped. And that is why it is said that the chain is the best chain and it's a golden chain. The Imam then continued until he reached uh, Khurasan. He was very much welcomed by the Ma'moon and many people who had lined up the streets and it was a joyful occasion that they had uh, been blessed with the opportunity to see the grandson of the Holy Prophet of Islam. He was then taken to where Al Ma'moon was there and Al Ma'moon spoke to him and offered to him the Caliphate. And he said to him, but I desire and I see that you are the most worthy individual from the family of Ali, from the progeny of Ali ibn Abi Talib, to take this caliphate. He was having trouble with his own people, Abbasid. 
So he had to justify why he was giving up his caliphate to the sons of the Holy Prophet. Because now, what he was actually doing was, he was taking it away from the lineage of the Abbasites onto the Holy Prophet. <laughs> Imam Rabba alayhi salam knew exactly that al mamun would never relinquish and surrender the Khilafah. And of course this was a ploy in order to somehow demonstrate to the people that al mamun was willing to give it up to the sons of Ali. So Imam Rabba alayhi salam refused. They've tried all the other ways it hasn't worked is put the Imam into power then tell the people that, look, the Imam whom you say has renounced this world has not renounced this world. He loves this world and that's why he's taken all this time. And dirty his hands in the cruelty that was taking place within the Caliphate of Abbasai. So that was his grand plan. When he sat with the Imam and he offered him with honor the Caliphate, the Imam refused. But he insisted, no, you must. At that time, the Imam gave him an argument which he could not, he had no reply for. Imam said that Caliphate, as we say, as it's been going on, is ordained by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In other words, the position that you have attained as a Caliph is from Allah. So if that is the case, and it is from Allah, then you should not vacate it because it is the wish of Allah. However, if that caliphate does not belong to you, then you have no right to give up something that is not to you. And a ma'moon at that time did not have a reply. Knowing that if Imam accepts the caliphate, he becomes the heir apparent, then with his schemes, if he is able to get rid of the Imam, he automatically becomes a caliph. See how much authority he can have over the people because he can say, now I have become an heir apparent of Musa ibn Raza. These were the, 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 the reasons why he was trying to convince the Imam to take it. An Imam very well knew, being an Imam, what he was trying to do. There was no genuine offer, but it was more a political offer. And Imam did not want to get himself involved in this. You are not to accept the caliphate, then you must accept to be the heir to the throne. In other words, Wali al Ahd. Imam alayhi salam refused once again and did not want to take this position. And this needs to be emphasized that the Imam Salam Allah alayhi understood the whole intention and the plot of the Abbasids and especially Ma'mun and what he wanted to establish. Yet narrations in history say that al mamun said to him, just like how your grandfather Ali ibn Abi Talib was forced to be amongst those in the Shura after the death of Umar ibn al-Khattab, one of the six, then I also force you to be the heir to the throne. In other words, he mentioned that Umar ibn al-Khattab, the second Khalifa said, whomsoever disagrees, then you must kill him from amongst the six. And he mentioned this to highlight to the Imam that if you do not agree, then your life will not be spared and that uh, uh, it will be in danger. And Imam alayhi salam reluctantly agreed but placed certain conditions. We have strong evidences that the Imam did not accept. We have strong evidences, proofs, to say that when he requested the Imam, Imam said, no, no, I don't want this. Because he knew that it is either a political game or that he will not stand or he can't continue the uh, appointment or that is, again, something which is temporary solution for whatever I mean problem was there but in the long term this wasn't practical yeah Imam knew that 
but he was forced to do so. And uh, when somebody is coerced to do something uh, against his own wish, especially when there are some threats here and there, not only for himself, even for the whole community. So the Imam Ali Salam said, okay. But what happened that on the very first demonstration of Imam's position as to lead the Eid prayer, when uh, Al Ma'mun noticed and his consultants and advisors, yeah, uh, noticed that, oh, now everybody will turn to Imam Rida alayhi salam and they will have this strong uh, allegiance to Ahl al-Bayt So immediately changed in mind and led to the martyrdom of the Imam Acceptance of uh, Imam Rada salam to become the heir to the throne to Ma'mun was that um, I do not uh, instruct, in other words, I do not initiate any commands Neither do I prohibit, neither do I give any fatwa, neither do I become a judge in any matter, neither do I appoint anyone or sack anyone, neither any involvement in the day-to-day -day running of the uh, government or the rulership. In other words, what the Imam salam wanted to do was to highlight that al Ma'mun had simply uh, forced the Imam to become his heir to the throne just as a name. In other words, he was just there um, for the purposes of Al Ma'mun and uh, that he would not take place in uh, the day to day running of uh, the uh, governorship at that time. It does not mean the Imam never did Amr bil Ma'roof, Nahiyan al Munka, because every time Ma'amun did something wrong, he would admonish him that you have not done this right, you have not done this right, this is not what you should be doing it. And day by day Ma'amun realized that he is not achieving his aims and his goals, that he thought that he would gain out of this, but he was not. In fact, he was, Imam kept constantly reminding him to fear Allah and what he was doing was not right. And he was not acting for the benefit of the Muslim. He used those two years that he was in Mad for the benefit of the Ummah. What happened? Three main things happened. First, people got to know the Prophet's family better. Before they had heard, they heard about the Prophet, how he would talk, how he would walk, how he would dress and the Prophet's family, but they had never seen it with their eyes. What the Imam did was give them the opportunity to see with their own eyes how we talk, how we interact with people, how we dress, how we worship Allah. <laughs> Shabbat shalom, 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 shalom